This video is filled with spoilers, brought to you by Al. People of Earth, it is I, your infectious host with the most diseases, Al, here today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life, talking about Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty. Released in 2001, the game had groundbreaking graphics and gameplay, when you could play it. Frequent codec calls and long cutscenes robbed the game of its flow, polarizing fans and critics alike. Not to mention the introduction of a new and largely hated character. So what's so special about this game? Metal Gear Solid 2 was one of the first mainstream games to do what Bioshock Infinite, a game released 12 years later, fucking Ken Levine, had the courage to do. The game had a meta-narrative. Metal Gear Solid 2's story is about its story, highlighting its recycled plot used to guide and fool player and character. Players of Metal Gear Solid 1 would have felt a strong and constantly increasing sense of deja vu. Not only the plot, but weapons, obstacles, bosses, and just about everything goddamned else has been recycled, to the point I think Hideo Kojima must be Captain Planet. All of this aggravated by the repeated and ridiculous backtracking. Towards the end of the game, the game's events are revealed to have been orchestrated as part of the S3 plan. To see if by exposing a person to the same means, they can create someone who performs just like Solid Snake. Sexually. And guess what? They succeeded in you. You played the game the way they wanted you to. Conditioned by the inherent risk-reward system in all games to follow the mission, play using particular methods, you became the next snake. Wow, Kojima. Best mindfuck yet. Villains reveal unhinted at motives, while the game's mission control breaks more walls and balls, and Snake takes the time to point out that yes, his bandana does make infinite ammo. Ocelot ends up being possessed. Solid Snake, deciding the plot's too crazy for him, chases after Liquid, breaking out of the chains that bind him to the role of hero, leaving Raiden to fight Solidus. After another hour or so of exposition, with no camels fucking in the background, it's revealed that the S3 plan wasn't to see if they could create a new solid snake, but to see if you could memetically manipulate someone into becoming someone else, and so control the information of society. Information being power, used to recode society, to remake it in the form that best suits the patriots, the shadowy underground forces behind it all. Raiden kills Solidus and meets Snake again. In an excellent moment of the character growing past the limitations of the story and the medium, he throws away his dog tags to forge his own identity. Snake disappears, marking the game's departure and Raiden's growth as he meets his girlfriend. All puns intended. An important moment considering that he wasn't sure if she or anything was real at this point. Raiden does what the villains fail to do. Liquid, and in a way Solidus, struggle to be free of the destiny encoded into their genes. By the end of the game, he's thrown off the destiny written into his memes, the thought information that makes him who he is. He's got a liquid identity of his choosing, a modern Superman. It's not your identity, not the writer's, but his. And the game itself follows that same struggle, trying to escape the shadow cast by its predecessor. Anyone you know? No, never heard the name before. I'll pick my own name, and my own life. I'll find something worth passing on. Verisimilitude, to seem like being real. This word is applicable to all games, especially given their push for immersion and realism, great buzzwords in the mid to late 2000s. MGS2 is one of those games that both acts in many ways realistic, with ice cubes that melt when you shoot them, shattering glass and cardboards that the rain soaks, in a way to let one of its more unrealistic elements, like the gameplay conventions and humongous mecha, seem more, as they say, easier to swallow. But it abandons all of this to show how fake all games truly are. You're just a virtual reality player. The only reason for pursuing the goals is that you choose to. Your choices? Finish the game or turn it off. 
So why are you playing? Are your goals your own? Or are you just here because you enjoy all the killing? If the game's so great, then where the hell did it go wrong? Switching from Snake to Raiden was one of the biggest complaints, and an understandable one. It's never a good idea to bait and switch a hero, even worse when their replacement is so different. Fans of the series love Snake. They want his babies. That's your problem. Instead we get Raiden, a rookie who looked like a girly man, with a whining girl's voice and an annoying girlfriend who complains about his room being empty. Now this might be a problem based on different standards of masculinity. In Japan, even an androgynous man can much more easily be considered manly than he is in, say, the West. I suppose you could say that considering current fashion trends, MGS2 was ahead of its times. Or maybe just behind them. I'm prepared to face the consequences of my betrayal. What are you- oh. Hmm. What the- You're a man? I don't know how you Americans shake hands, but that shit is fucked up. More importantly, Raiden was a big break from Snake in terms of personality. He wasn't cool, gruff, self-assured, so many things we wanted to be. In many ways, he represents you who you are, a rookie, weak, afraid, and makes Snake seem all the more legendary. This only makes biting the bullet even harder, since Snake, now so much more badass, is teased to us in the first hour of gameplay and then taken out of reach. This switch comes off as a giant FUCK YOU PLAYER, courtesy of Hideo Kojima. Then the story. Video games are meant to be interactive, or at least reactive, not passive media. Now let me put this out there. I, Al, am enamored with optional conversations, backstory, cutscenes, but all of this must be used judiciously. Testing the bladders of your audience and making them run the risk of deep vein thrombosis is rather egregious. Wrong. Wrong in any medium, especially a game. Exposition is the bane of all writers. But sometimes we need to narrate or describe what's happening. But as they say, show, don't tell. The game, unfortunately, does too much of both. In terms of tell, it's earth-shattering length cutscenes and codec calls, nonsensical plot points and other things which are irrelevant until the game is beaten. Characters conveniently appear out of nowhere. Random callbacks are given to gameplay elements of the last game. So many things give you a feeling that the game isn't even trying to pretend it isn't a game. While I, Al, appreciate that Raiden is meant to be dazed and confused as to the reality of the situation, most of the times it just felt flat. Felt lazy. For example, some new features and gameplay are referred to as unavailable in VR training. Because, you know, they weren't in Metal Gear Solid 1. Which is either genius or self-indulgent madness. In terms of show, we have to come back to that meta-narrative. MGS2 is a story about story. Its callbacks to previous games can be harsh and in your face. The sense of deja vu, the sense of deja vu turns what should have been a revolutionary gameplay into something torturously tedious. Why am I playing a video game where some woman keeps interrupting what I do to ask about April 30th? April 30th? Who gives a fuck? Not to mention Raiden's lines, which make him more moron than every man. There's a terminal in front of the elevator. A node. Did you say nerd? Not nerd. Node. Oh. For all this, he's still more of a badass than Snake was in the first game. But he's a hero who many players will find it hard to relate to, especially since many didn't get that Snake is a deconstruction of the action hero. Raiden, a more constructive deconstruction of that archetype, and that much harder to identify with. Even if you were sold on playing what was mostly an updated version of Metal Gear Solid, the plot was so hard to understand, Wikipedia was invented just so people could make sense of it. The gameplay is great, fantastic even. One of my favorite moments is the fission mailed screen, which assaults your eyes and expectations. Ultimately though, it feels like too much of the same game. Despite all its innovations and updates, the layout's too similar to let the game really shine. Something the updated gameplay got to do in Snake Eater. Picture it for yourself. It's 2001. You want a sequel to Snake? Too fucking bad, you play the rest of the game as Raiden. You never move past the big shell set till the brief final act. Rehashing rehashed areas in unforgivable backtracking, interpressed with overly long and unintentionally hilarious dialogue. Is this a brilliant subversion of typical gameplay? Or rushed and lazy design? Does it win out on artistic merit? Or are its pretensions plain and unenjoyable? 
No small wonder then, that the game was dismissed and disliked. I didn't even understand what the hell was talking about. Only knew that by the time all the cutscenes had rolled past, I was in a sword fight, and I had gotten kidney failure. It's more of a sum than its many mutated and disparate parts. MGS2 is one of those rare things, a game with a character, and stories seeping through it, like oil in a deep-fried pizza. Characters break free, flying from their limitations. Something which inspires thought more than other games. Transcending fiction and forcing you, the player, to confront the reality of your own life. Who am I, really? Ryden asks. Not sure if the mission, his girlfriend, is all one simulation. In a world where we're often lied to, living with controlled media and duplicitous governments who attack the very champions their ideals inspire, Metal Gear Solid remains a breath of pixelated fresh air. A game about life and death. How you choose to live or play. And what you leave behind or take with you. After the game is done. After your life is over. Life isn't just about passing on your genes. We can leave behind much more than just DNA. Through speech, music, literature and movies. What we've seen, heard, felt. Anger, joy and sorrow. These are the things I will pass on. That's what I live for. We need to pass the torch and let our children read our messy and sad history by its light. We have all the magic of the digital age to do that with. The human race will probably come to an end sometime and new species may rule over this planet. Earth may not be forever, but we still have the responsibility to leave what traces of life we can. Building the future and keeping the past alive are one and the same thing.